Kevin Kelly um, with the Long Now Foundation. And so um, not only did Stuart volunteer to um, take Jared Diamond's place at the last minute, but he had the great misfortune of having his laptop stolen last night after he had worked on a all week a blitz to develop this um, talk, which, by the way, is the first time he's ever talked on this. It's, so it's a brand new um, topic, uh, brand new speech, and a long gone uh, slideshow, which he recreated um, this afternoon. Okay, so if he's a little bit... <laughs> Uh, so yeah, so so be nice to him. I'm I'm sure this was not exactly as it was last night in his practice run, um, but I'm sure also that it'll be amazing. And it's about the city planet, a long-term trend happening on the planet, little noticed by anybody, and um, a part of the long-term view. I won't introduce Stuart because he's the host of this series and. As a practice, we tend not to do introductions because they're easily found. On your card, you have a long list of his cultural innovations through time. Um, but he is um, always interesting and I'm sure will, will amaze us again with uh, a new view. So here's Stuart. This could be you. Paying attention to that world, I keep finding new news. And it's news that I'm not seeing anywhere else. Uh, you find it hidden down in the UN uh, population reports and in uh, little known books like one that Paul Hawken gave me on uh, the slums of the world, which is excellent. It's really the best book in that stack. And it fit with some of the thinking that's been going on around Long Now for a while in ways that may be different than what the UN and, and others are, are thinking about it in. So you'll see connections with other talks here <clears throat> with uh, Phil Longmans from several months ago, uh, from Rob Newers in June, and really from all of them because there's, um, there's something deep going on. Um, this will give you an indication. All right, we're going to do a workaround here. And um, <laughs> I've seen this enough times, I think I can actually do the sound. <laughs> All right, here we are. Four, three, two, one, fire, fire. Bam, 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 bam. Bam, 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 bam. Bam, 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 bam. Ladies and gentlemen, you've just witnessed history. Yeah, well, that's the history of cities. <laughs> that's what they do. That's what their, uh, their specialty is. They, even in Europe, European cities change their fabric two to three percent a year, which means they completely change over their physical makeup about every 50 years. And that's the slowest part of the world. Here in the US, our cities turn over faster. In the developing world, they turn over faster. And so, uh, even ancient cities, they look like they're cities on a hill. They're actually cities made that made the hill. These are tells. This one happens to be Tel Beersheba in Israel. And you can always tell where a city was in the Middle East because you look around for, around for a flat top hill. It's made of the old buildings that fell down gradually, debris, garbage, poop, 
skeletons. And uh, that's what cities do, is they, they grow up on top of their own uh, past. Uh, even in a place like Boston, this is a page from How Buildings Learn, uh, between 1860 and 1981, none of the buildings in the first photograph are in the second photograph, except for the Old South Church, which is still there. Uh, it was kept for historical reasons. Some of the early Revolutionary War stuff happened there. But what's also interesting is, is you see some of the streets are still the same. Uh, Washington down here, Franklin up there. And while the fabric changes, something doesn't. Cities have patterns. They have a character. They have some things that are extremely durable. So one of the reasons Long Now is so interested in cities is they, well, they're some of the fastest changing things that people do, most rapidly changing organizations. They're also the oldest. Uh, there's cities like uh, Jericho that is uh, 10,000 to 500 years old, still occupied. Uh, back in the very early days, 500 years after the farmers set up shop there, they built a tower, which I used to have a picture of, uh, that was amazing. 10,000 years ago, they built a tower 30 feet wide. The stub is 30 feet high. No one knows how high the original was. And it had a sophisticated spiral staircase inside it and a huge wall. Uh, Jericho carries on to this day. Places like uh, nearby Jerusalem continues to be an important city. Uh, century after century, millennium after millennium, and it's been run by nearly everybody in that part of the world, <laughs> one time or another, usually after a sacking. And so the city would be destroyed, and then the Maccabees would take over, and the Persians would take over, and then the Greeks would take over, and the Romans would take over, and the Muslims would take over, and then the Christian Crusaders took over, and then the Ottoman Turks got it, and the Brits had it for a while, and the Israelis have it for now. Uh, this is what happens with cities. They, they go through enormous change, but they endure. Many of them endure. And I think that robustness, that resilience is one of the things that we can be looking at in civilizational terms. Okay, come to the present moment. Uh, right now, we're at a crossing point in history where the world population, the rural population has been, this is just going back to 1950. You go all the way back, it gets much stranger. Uh, has been gradually leveling off and is now about to start dropping. Meanwhile, urban population is increasing enormously and the crossover point is 50%. Uh, right now that's expected to be in two years, 2007. The majority of people on earth will be uh, urban dwellers. This is uh, somewhat new because uh, not so long ago, 200 years ago, it was 3% of humans lived in cities. 100 years ago, 105 years ago, it was 14% lived in cities. You can tell something ferocious is going on when you have a trend like that moving along. And uh, by the way, the, you know, the expectation is that by 2030, uh, another 25 years from now, it'll be 61%. This is world size. Now, this is one of the slides that Phil Longman used. I'm coming back to it because I'm going to, we're in a sense expanding on it tonight. The developed world, uh, past the, the majority point for urban dwellers way back in 1950. And what you can expect is that the less developed regions are coming right along and are going to basically follow this pattern. And so the whole will increasingly follow the pattern developed countries have already gone in, through. What's coming on now, and what's kind of interesting in this diagram, which is one I found today and added, uh, is the sequence of events. Uh, the purple is uh, the growth up to the year 2000, and the red is the part expected from, from now on. So Japan and Tokyo grew a humongous amount 
got to about 26.4 million, and the expectation is it's going to stay right there. Uh, whereas other places, uh, especially in India and in China and in Africa, like in Lagos, uh, these places, their biggest growth is yet to come. These are really, really big cities. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I had a list of the top 10 in New York used to be in them, and it's barely in, uh, it used to lead the way 50 years ago, and now it's barely on the list. So I think we're looking at, turns out historically the numbers are such that this is the most massive movement of humans in history. And, uh, one of the numbers is thrown around is every week a million new people show up in cities in the world. Um, Global Business Network, and I have been looking at China recently, and it's interesting that the people talking about China uh, and the Chinese expect 300 million people to move into town. That's a quarter of the present population. The population is still going up rather slowly, so what you're seeing is people leaving the countryside and moving into the city. So this is some kind of tipping point we're right at right now. Um, it's a shift of, of depth that uh, I think we'll be finding out for the rest of our lives. Part of what's going on is there's uh, structural things going on with globalization that, uh, for example, tend to go right to the cities, go right past the national boundaries, right past the national governments, right to the cities where the action is. The bigger these cities get, the more that's the case. And a lot of the developing countries, especially where these huge cities are, uh, and some of them the government has really been discredited and uh, everybody's figuring out workarounds to get past them. Uh, the multinational corporations go straight to where the workers and the markets are, if they can and increasingly they can and they do, and that increases the, the whole process. Likewise, NGOs, uh, and there are all kinds of them involved in the cities now, uh, go straight to where the action is. They've stopped giving money to the governments because it goes to Switzerland. Instead, they take their people and their money to the cities where the need actually is, and then that helps the cities. And there's something that is being called subsidiarity, uh, where there's a uh, a fashion to move power down to regions and governments, and that is at least uh, weakening the uh, state governments and to some extent in increasing power at the lower level. So I think you can say that there's a real geometrical, mathematical, statistical difference here, which is that nations are pretty much defined by their boundaries. And more and more of what's going on is not interested in boundaries, it's interested in centers, it's interested in nodes. And cities are centers, they are nodes. And so uh, this is a, a way to look at the world. That's the world at night made out of real images, um, made by the Defense Department actually, and then assembled by NASA. And you don't see much national boundaries there. What you see is cities and the uh, avenues between them. This is a connectivity map. That's what cities are about. And uh, that's what the Earth looks like at night. Uh, you can say that the dark side of the Earth, the stars shine down, and these days the Earth is shining right back. The cities are shining right back. One thing I did pull off the net today is a uh, poem from Robert Frost. Of all people, he said this. He said, the city is all right. To live in one is to be civilized, stay up and read, or sing and dance all night, and see sunrise by waiting up instead of getting up. <laughs> and so the round goes. Meanwhile, uh, Another way to look at the Earth, this is just one of many internet maps. Uh, this one happens to be what's called the core, and it's showing uh, the, uh, period, the linking, the pier linkings that go on, in this case, between, uh, oh, is this thing blitzed out? Oh, well, that was fast. Uh, the lower 
hunk there is North America, up to the left I believe is Asia, over to the right is Europe. And among other things it's showing there's a lot of linkage between North America and Europe, North America and Asia, not much between Asia and Europe yet. So functionally, North America is still the core of the internet. But Europe is coming on strong, Asia is coming on strong, and, and they have wonderful time series of this particular diagram that, uh, that gives you uh, a sense that this is a fast changing view of the world. I want to expand a little further on, on what was said a couple months ago by Phil Longman. Cities are population sinks. Um, it turns out historians and demographers have been noticing this for a while. They always have been population sinks. And what happens is people move into town and the birth rate goes down to the replacement level that Phil Longman talked about of 2.1 children per woman. And it keeps right on going. And so you see uh, not just a leveling off, but a, a real dropping. One of the issues is, clearly, uh, it turns out that, that when you live in the countryside, kids are a real asset. More to help on the farm, uh, more to marry off. But once you get in the city, uh, they turn into a liability. So, you know, which would you rather have, a child or a million dollars? And the time to enjoy it. <laughs> <laughs> and one demographer I mentioned this to you, Joseph Jamie, said, uh, that seems like a really low figure. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll use another one of, uh, of the diagrams that slides that uh, Phil Longman had here. This is the uh, median projection the UN is doing now, going all the way to 9 billion, but about 7.6 billion. And then at a uh, birth rate of 1.85 children per woman, stabilizing at that, this is what happens over 300 years. Basically, you get back down to the 2 point something billion that we had in 1960. So humanity is, is not only experienced a doubling of its population in basically our lifetime, it's the last doubling. And so it's those two events. You know, the one event was incredible. A lot of us organized a lot of activity around, oh my God, where's the population going to go? But then if it hauls off and stops, also in our lifetime, there's, you know, there's more coming. But you'll see that there's only so many more coming. That means that this kind of a turn is a major turn in how people think about people, how people think about the earth and each other. One of the elements of this is that during this period of transition, you're going to get a whole lot more old people and a whole lot fewer young people. And so Phil's book is called The Empty Cradle. A number of countries now are trying like mad to uh, get their birth rates back up. And it turns out it's just as hard to make people have more babies as it was to make them have fewer babies. They just do what they're going to do. And uh, they get into town and they're, you know, they got business to tend to. So you have probably a, a trend coming where the cities will be occupied by the young people. That's what's happening in the developing world. And to some extent, it's what's happening in the, in the developed world. Old people go and retire in the countryside, or just never leave the countryside, stay there until they die. So you not only have a whole lot of urban growth, you've got a whole lot of young urban growth. And uh, that has this other element that the expectations now is there's another 2 billion people coming. We've got 6.5 billion now. There's as many as another 2 billion coming in the next 30 or so years all of that growth will be in cities. The, the rural population is at least level during that time and, and probably going down. And one of the peculiarities, as we're pointing out, is that people who are in cities have the lowest birth rates. So you've got a combination of young people in the cities not having kids because they're busy being urban, and old people not having kids because they don't do that anymore. <laughs> all right, let me change the subject a little bit. Uh, this is a diagram I've been flogging for a couple of years now. Even this slide didn't work, it had to be resized. <laughs> a 
but it's a, a jumped up version of what I did about buildings that you can separate <clears throat> any dynamic thing, any robust thing into a series of layers that work at different paces. And uh, there's fast parts, in this case, uh, showing fashion, commerce, and then infrastructure, sort of the five-year plan level of infrastructure, on down to slower things like governance, not governments, which turn over pretty quickly, but govern the way governing is done in a place, on down to culture, which is quite slow, and nature, which has these humongously slow things. I mean, you can say, but the tsunami was pretty quick, but you only have tsunamis and over the very long period of time and developing the, the cultural muscle memory for these long lag things or for things that creep up on you like global climate change. Um, that's the sort of thing that is why you get so much power from, from the bottom of these layers. <clears throat> One example I give of uh, why I think this is a good cross section of any healthy civilization uh, from Athenian to maybe ours, is that when you see a, uh, a nation, an empire like the Soviet Union, try to change it so that basically everything was run at kind of infrastructure pace, five-year plans, and they pretty much uh, looked down on commerce, threw away fashion, threw away culture, and uh, changed their governance way too fast when they started, and not too surprisingly, it changed pretty quickly when it quit. And so it became a brittle, uh, a brittle civilization. Uh, another example, uh, here we go to Turkey in 1999, there was an earthquake. By the way, does anybody else have a laser pointer that I could borrow? This is weirdly, ha, uh, ah, it came back. <laughs> Who knows, maybe the sound will come back. Um, what you see here is, is commerce having too much influence on governance. Basically, uh, Turkey had perfectly good building codes, but the commercial folks could buy off the building inspectors with bribes and go ahead and build any old kind of building, and they did. And an earthquake came along and took it down. So there was already a, a misapplication of, of, uh, between the pace layers there. But another interesting element is what's this building still doing up? Well, it's a mosque from a 1,200-year-old religion, and it, it apparently knows about earthquakes. <laughs> and you could say, well, you know, that's a kind of a neat photograph, but you know, what about the mosque down the street, and does that really illustrate anything? So you, know, you go to Sumatra last December and, <laughs> and find pictures like this. Well, that, okay, that's a fluke, right? Well. <laughs> <laughs> As you can imagine, I got these from an Islamicist site that said, <laughs> this is obviously a miracle. Allah is looking out for his own. But it does show that one of the things uh, that, you can, that you hope for is that the cultural parts of your civilization are in tune with uh, the nature parts. Those two slow, deep, profound things uh, bear relation to each other. And this is one case where you can see it pretty clearly. So just to uh, dissect that diagram a little bit, what I'm proposing is the fast stuff, uh, like fashion and commerce is always uh, learning things and proposing things. And the slow parts, their job is to dispose what's good and not so good, and uh, to remember the stuff that's worth remembering, or worth going back to. When shocks come to the system, like a technology, uh, suddenly self-accelerating technology comes into your civilization, what's going to take up the, the shock of that? And it's probably going to be fashion and commerce, and then the dragging ass along behind the uh, governance, and having grave doubts about the whole thing from culture. <laughs> Discontinuity is the main event in the fast parts. Uh, the way fashion works is by always making sure that the thing you cared about last year is now out of fashion, and you need to buy this new thing. And then that happens again and again. By the way, you see young people uh, tend toward the top of this diagram. Uh, they are absolutely into fashion and pretty much uninterested in cultural history. And older people like me tend to migrate down toward the bottom of the diagram. We're completely interested in culture and stuff like the history of cities and fashion bores us to death. 
you get uh, constraint and constancy. A game can go on if there's basically game rules, understanding of what the, the limits within which you do various things. And that comes from the slow stuff. And uh, the, 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 let's try it this different way. Uh, the deeper stuff beyond just proposing things, real revolution comes from the faster parts. The main thing in an accelerating time, like we're, or what feels like an accelerating time like we're experiencing right now, is most of the stuff that you see is about the fast stuff. That's where all the attention is. That's when the newspapers and the magazines and the books. But the actual power, and I learned this from ecology, is in the slow things. The butterfly does not drive the forest. The trees drive the forest. And the butterflies go along on sufferance. That is the case with many of the relationship between these slow and fast parts of, of a dynamic system like civilization. I was uh, asked recently to, uh, to do a diagram on how cities learn, um, how cities uh, deal with things in the world. And I was gonna take the civilization diagram and figure out the different elements that would apply to a city. And I couldn't find any, any way to parse it out differently. So I wound up using this diagram and came to the momentous conclusion that actually civilization and cities are the same thing. It's, it's where the word comes from. Historians are constantly saying that civilization is what happens in cities. And the, uh, most of the history that we describe of civilization is city stuff. Um, cities move to, do move pretty quickly. Here's an example which fortunately has no sound. I'm happy to say it has no sound. You'll recognize the area. This is 80 years of the San Francisco Bay Area uh, urbanizing. And you know, usually there's sinister music with uh, <laughs> videos like this. Oh, look at the cancer growing on that healthy California coast. And I don't know, it looks to me like the you know, inert California coast had this healthy, uh, fast-moving organism come along. Um, you can flip the sign bit often on cities of, oh, they're evil, or, oh, they're actually pretty good. In any case, more going on in the Bay Area at the end of this 80 years than there was at the beginning. Well, let me say a little more about how I think that speed in terms of cities is not necessarily a bad thing. And I've got to tell a little bit of a, I'm going to drop a name. Prince Charles <laughs> asked me to come. <laughs> to the Prince's Foundation in London a couple months ago. Um, not personally, but he was there and we talked and he said nice things about me and I said nice things about him, or at least about his, you know, the monarchy, which does help Britain think long term. I, I explained them that we don't have a monarchy, so we're building a 10,000 year clock instead. <laughs> <laughs> But the subject of that particular meeting was, uh, there's, I guess, going to be 800,000 new homes being built all of a sudden in the southeast of England between the Thames and the Channel. And because uh, they got housing problems there and they want to solve it kind of all in one go. And they expect a lot of that housing, if not most of it, to be manufactured housing. Well, England is held back from manufactured housing. Sweden and Germany and various other European places have gone ahead and, and manufacture housing like mad and, and like it. So the Prince's Foundation was had a great big meeting, long, day long meeting on how do you preserve local identity in uh, of instantly manufactured set of new towns. And um, Three or four of the speakers before that, everybody was there, the Minister of Housing and you know, the Prince of Wales comes, other people show up. And I, I did, right? And so the number of the people before me that spoke uh, used this very photograph, you can find it on the net, and it's uh, Levittown in Pennsylvania in the late 1940s. And basically all these somewhat stylistically inclined speakers were saying, this is what we don't need in England. 
uh, that this is how bad manufactured tract housing can be. So I went on after a few of these folks and I got up and I started my presentation with this slide and said, I want to uh, show you a little more about Levittown. Um, if you go and look at the old photographs, and they do have some before and after photographs, uh, it's pretty interesting the changes that have occurred between 1950 and 50 years later in 2000. Uh, basically what happened is, I learned this from Peter Schwartz, when you go to Levittown now, it looks like just another Pennsylvania neighborhood. In other words, local identity was in no way suppressed. Uh, in fact, it, it seemed to have happened uh, pretty straightforwardly. And uh, here's why. So here you see one of the you know, six or seven different models you could get. Uh, $11,600 of your GI Bill money would uh, get you a place with a yard and lots of neighbors from your generation where you then created the baby boom. <laughs> uh, and there are a number of things about these. They were built about one a day. There really was manufactured housing that was site built. For example, they, uh, they developed uh, slab on grade. These places didn't have basements. And the second floor was left um, unfinished. And the idea was that the owners would do whatever they wanted with the second floor, make it an attic or a rumpus room or more bedrooms for the kids as they came on. And the, a whole secondary industry developed around the Levitt towns of coming and helping you uh, figure out what to do with your uh, second floor. And so over time, these things all became uh, quite various. A little more web uh, searching turned up a number of sites about Levittown, and there are no longer critical sites about Levittown. All of the sites about Levittown are nostalgic. And uh, you, you find things, and, and, you know, you can get mementos from them, and people reminiscing and having all these discussion groups and so on, remembering growing up in Levittowns, and they're collecting the old magazines that used to go out to everybody in one of these houses called Thousand Lanes. And you could hear the blood draw, <laughs> fall out of the heads of all Englishmen, a thousand lanes. You know, what, what a <laughs> contradiction in something. But uh, among the things that are in the Thousand Lanes magazines is uh, helpful hints for maintaining and improving your Levittown homes. So what I propose to the Prince's Foundation is that when you see user groups like this developing around something, and Alexander Rose pointed out when he heard this last night, this is a, a, a case where ubiquity creates community. When everybody is having the same experience, they can share car parts in a sense. And so there's a, a community event that went on with all these people having the same homes. But the contrast comes with gated communities. And uh, typical in gated communities is they have their famous uh, CCs and R's, covenants, conditions, and restrictions that uh, have details like all drapes, curtains, window coverings, shutters, or blinds visible from the street or common areas shall be beige, white, or off-white. Take your pick. <laughs> There'll be no outside laundering or drying of clothes, and on and on. And this is the norm with uh, a lot of these communities that are run by the neighborhood association, the owners' associations. What's going on is that these places are being treated primarily as real estate. And uh, so everything has to do with keeping the real estate value up. And if you can hang laundry out in your backyard where people can see it, that's going to take the real estate value of your neighbors down, and uh, they don't want you to. And the power that goes to some of these communities is such they can take away your home if you uh, violate those restrictions. Uh, by contrast, you go to... Uh, street in Portland, ordinary house. This is exactly the kind of thing which gated communities are designed to prevent. <laughs> <laughs> so my point to the Princess Foundation, I didn't make it as well then as, as I should have, but it became clearer to me, is look, it doesn't matter <clears throat> what the style and the fabric of the homes you build is. If they're treated as speculative real estate, local identity will not happen. If they're treated as homes and people are primarily living in them, 
and there's some continuity that is coming, then it, local identity will happen whether you want it to or not. And it really comes down to not something that architects do as to what kind of building you have or what kind of style it is. It's much more how does the actual design of the real estate deals work. And we'll see uh, more of this when we get to some of the uh, squatter cities. Now, another issue that came up, of course, at this meeting was the whole question of manufactured homes. So it turns out that Toyota is manufacturing homes. And since there are no manufactured homes companies in England at this point, I said, why don't you go straight to the top? You've got a great corporation in Toyota. Bring them here and let them build your 8,000 homes. They'll do a hell of a job. And, but then the question is, of course, you know, a mass-produced product like that, uh, can, can people actually take something so hard and mass and remote and global and all this stuff and, and turn it into something really personal? And the answer is yes. <laughs> I love showing this slide to the English. <laughs> And they love seeing it. Meanwhile, out in the countryside, the very places, uh, countries where these trucks are happening, uh, what's happening out in the landscape? Here's uh, a place in Africa. Uh, here's a place, I think that one's in Bolivia. Uh, here's another one in Latin America. The sequence got scrambled, so I don't remember the names. Um, that one's in Syria. These are empty villages. Uh, that one's in Russia, when the Russian and uh, Soviet uh, economy and world collapsed. They stopped subsidizing a lot of the rural living, and people left as soon as they could. Uh, this one's up in the Northern Islands. Uh, that's in South Africa. This is in China. And that's a uh, totally empty fishing village on an island very close to Hong Kong. All over the world, I've been asking travelers and journalists and, and everybody who's coming from various parts of the world, uh, are the villages and the countryside emptying out where you just were? And the answer was, my gosh, how did you know? And it is, as near as I can tell, universal that the world's uh, villages are, are just going hollow. And fortunately, a couple of years ago, I, you know, I used to romanticize about villages like everybody else who's sort of green. And I was at a meeting in uh, Aspen where I heard this statement made. In the village, all there is for a woman is to obey her husband and family elder, pound grain, and sing. If she moves to town, she can get a job, start a business, and get education for her children. Her independence goes up, and her religious fundamentalism goes down. That was said by this lady, Kavita Ramdas, who's nearby actually president of the Global Fund for Women. Here's the dynamic. Life in the country is dull, backbreaking, impoverished, restricted, exposed, and dangerous. And I didn't really understand this uh, until I spent time with the book that you gave me, Paul, on slums. They sent serious researchers to serious squatter cities to find out how the economy and the people and the stuff really works. And a lot of these folks had uh, scales dropped from their eyes because they you know, asked real questions for real families. That are really getting by in town. Why are you here? Uh, it looks like total squalor. Look where you live. My God, you're on the street. Uh, people can't bear to look at your part of town. It's, it's so congested and, and filthy and obviously unhealthy. And basically, the answer they got from folks is, you should have seen my village. <laughs> <laughs> and it turns out that it's actually quite dangerous. Out uh, especially in many parts of the world. Brigands get you, famine gets you, disease gets you, and there's no care nearby. Uh, you work like a bastard and uh, the weather changes, you don't have crops to sell, you're making it from week to week, you have a couple of bad weeks, you're in a bad way. In town it doesn't work like that. Uh, so the, the flip is that in the city, it's exciting, it's much less grueling kind of work available, it's better paid, uh, the freedom of cities is 
been an attraction forever, basically. You have privacy if you want it, and it is safe. It turns out again from the folks who are going there and looking is people don't much die on the streets of these squatter cities. They die out in the countryside. They may say, okay, yeah, that's fine for the develop, develop, developing world, but uh, you know, here in America, things are fine, right? Uh, this happens to be some pictures from rural Kentucky. Every state has this. Uh, you will find parts of California, I'm sure, that are emptying out. Eastern Oregon, Eastern Washington. The high plains are getting so empty that uh, they're being referred to as the Buffalo Commons. And here's the dynamic. Farm subsidies are one of many things that every government is doing to try to keep people out of the cities and back on the countryside. China's doing it, India's doing it, America's doing it. And it turns out there's no farm subsidy high enough to keep people on the land once it gets to be a 200 mile, mile drive to school. And that's what's happening in places like South Dakota and Nebraska and state after state. Uh, there are towns there now that are offering free land for anybody in this room to go and get you know, 100 acres with a house, all that kind of stuff, just move in, please, please keep our town alive. And they don't have any takers. Uh, so that's the, the pattern. Uh, it's interesting that, that uh, the governments have had so little success uh, trying to stay this tide or reverse it. So um, here's a typical place where everybody's going. This one happens to be in Rio. Uh, this is a plug for Rob Neuwirth's uh, book and for his talk. He'll be here month after next, and in a sense, I'm sort of uh, preparing the way for, for what he'll be saying. He's talking about, he wanted to call his talk um, the medieval 21st century city because these squatter cities have medieval qualities. They really are like our, the European medieval past. Um, and in some ways that's rough, and in some ways it's pretty interesting. So what are these cities like? Well, okay, here's Mumbai, uh, and then down here in Nairobi in Africa. Uh, Mumbai looks pretty horrible there. But the fact is, is Bombay, as it used to be called, one-sixth of the gross, dom gross domestic product of India is coming out of Mumbai. This is a place with a whole lot of economic action. And all these big cities are, and they do, uh, what's happening is the, the squatter cities are vibrant because they are medieval in a sense. They're organized by the people who are actually there. And then uh, they build the homes. Again, the, you know, this is sounding like a libertarian tirade or something, but when the governments build, architects come in and say, oh, all we need is really good housing. And uh, here we'll get some money from the government and I've got this wonderful design for this really low cost thing that everybody can live in. Those then become the worst part of the slums, inevitably. Apparently because they're not built, loved, and cared for by the people who are there. They're perfectly capable of building these homes. Uh, an interesting thing about it is, is they, uh, they do it with Family, they have family coming to and from whatever village they're from. They have family there in town. That's who's getting them their first jobs. That's who they're going into business with. That's who's getting together <clears throat> sometimes with a bunch of the neighbors to uh, uh, put up a, a structure. And then what's especially interesting is uh, where a whole lot of the real support is coming from. And it's basically religious groups. Islamicists in those cities, uh, Shivaji, uh, cult, they call it in, in uh, Mumbai, and Pentecostal Christians everywhere. And they are out there uh, doing what needs to be done. They are absolutely on the street with the folks, getting jobs, uh, taking care of medical issues, uh, connecting up with other NGOs who can be various kinds of aid, and uh, getting lots of converts. Why wouldn't they? by their fruits, I have to say they're doing pretty good. All of these squatter cities aren't just sitting there being poor. They have enormously active informal uh, economies going on. And uh, 
what are called agglomeration economies of these larger cities make more and more of the attractions, mainly higher wages, that keep people coming to them, even though they're absolutely enormous. These things are surprisingly resilient, both at the micro scale and at the macro scale. They got all kinds of problems. I don't want to romanticize these squatter cities the way we used to romanticize villages, because it would be just as wrong about that. But the fact is, people who can vote with their feet are going to these places, and they're going upstream toward a job and some money. And the, uh, the informal economy is often deeply interconnected with the formal economy. So, you know, the hotel is getting some work done by people who are over in uh, the favela across town, and on and on and on. It's a, uh, a pretty rich mix. What are we saying so far? I'm going to overstate it because it's part of recalibrating your thinking about something. What we've seen is basically the, the, concert, the population problem that you know, I starved four years ago that Paul Ehrlich said could only come through uh, basically government programs uh, got taken care of not by the demographic transition that Barry Commoner and others said was going to happen. If only we could get people out of poverty and get them a certain amount of money, then they'll have fewer kids, a certain amount of education, that'll be good, they'll get a, then they'll have fewer kids. Turned out that wasn't it. It's moving to town that does it. And then the other stuff happens. They do get more money, they do get more education, but the birth rate goes down as soon as they're in town. So the switch around that's come with a population explosion is uh, happening in cities. You go to these enormous cities and you see more poverty than you can possibly imagine. But what you're seeing is people who have been in poverty for a long time and are now in one place busy getting out of it as fast as they can and inventing all manner of means of doing it. And so, the, in some sense, the squalor that you see in the, in the slums and the squatter cities would be horrible if it was stable, if the people weren't moving through it, but the people are moving through it. It was stable back in the countryside, that's why they left. And so to a large extent, uh, some economists are now saying that uh, basically these cities, these mega cities are curing poverty. One thing I want to end on here is, this is a huge human event. What does it have to do with our relationship to natural systems? And I think there's a, a green dimension. One has already been pretty well stated, the idea of the economic footprint. Um, that the cities have a, a large amount of impact on an area much larger than they themselves are. And so, for example, Toronto, who's paying a lot of attention to this, has been saying, uh, uh, you know, the greater Toronto area, the GTA, uh, could get its footprint could get this much larger, and this is the kind of stuff that is making all of these impacts that we need to uh, keep after and, and make better. But I think there's more to the story than has been done with the economic footprint analysis so far. Because what it, I have not yet seen, and Paul, maybe you know of some, maybe someone else here knows of some, but I haven't seen good comparative analysis between basically a number of people in the city, the effect they're having on the landscape versus a number of people in the countryside and the effect they're having on the landscape. And remember, there's a lot of folks out there and it, it adds up. Um, furthermore, the comparisons can be peculiar. If you have a thousand people leave a county that had a thousand people in it and they move to town that has a million people, the change in that county is enormous. The change in the city is negligible. There was an article in the New Yorker um, a few years ago by a guy who uh, had gone off to Vermont with his wife and they were living the Carhartt life, uh, taking care of things and uh, he got to noticing that they were driving all of the time and building all of the time. There's a lot of waste coming through their process. And he eventually wound up back in New York saying New York is the greenest city in the world. Uh, if you think of it in terms of, uh, of the density and of the uh, per person fossil fuel use, 
he made an interesting argument for it. I don't think we really have as much information about these comparisons as, as we need yet. So for an environmental strategy, I'd say for a start, uh, I don't see a lot of awareness that this gross urbanization, massive urbanization is where all the action is and also where a lot of opportunity is uh, for a couple reasons. By the way, there's not much data. One factoid I came across was that um, in the last five years, there have been thousands of ecological papers. I used to be an ecologist, so okay, and I know what those papers are made of. How many of them were about urban ecology, city ecology? And it turns out 0.4% were. And if this is where humans are going, where the action is, where you want it to be green, I think uh, there's probably more opportunity for a young ecologist to uh, become uh, really good at dealing with cities. There's really two kinds of opportunities going on here. One is to immediately go out to these countrysides that are emptying out and protect the hell out of them. People will come back at a certain point, and when they come back, gentrifying it or whatever, retired folks going there or whatever, that's when you want to have a lot of the things already in place so that the natural systems are intact, so that the cycle of natural fires, uh, so that the floodplains, all these things are being dealt with in a sane way. At the same time, if everybody's in town, that's where one should be dealing and uh, you know, join the Pentecostal Christians in seeing what needs to be done with folks right there because that's where they're changing their lives and their minds. And they can change like many people do when they live in cities for a while into the, the nation's leading environmentalists. It's one of the things that you see in developed countries, that the country typically is much less green in its viewpoint. People in the city are much more green. And uh, that's a trend that could be helped and exacerbated. What's imaginable here is a, a world that is, goes in the direction of seriously green cities in a seriously green natural system environment. Um, I wanted an image of that. I actually wound up going to Corbis and buying it, not once, but twice. <laughs> <laughs> this happens to be Queenstown in New Zealand, so that's downtown Middle Earth. <laughs> and it's, it does show a nice balance of uh, natural landscape and, uh, and natural systems in, in a city which looks pretty damn attractive. Now, I have a killer finale, but it involves sound. <laughs> so what I'm going to do... Yeah, well, let's see if, see if that's good enough. If not, I've got to work around. But uh, anyway, here we go. I'm going to give the last word to Brian Eno, God willing.
Thank you. Let's have the uh, lights up a little bit in the room and also maybe the second uh, spot over here now that we're not showing serious pictures anymore. Great. Um, fantastic recovery, Stuart. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, the drill, in case uh, people have not been here before, is that you, if you have questions, you write them on the cards that are easily available and you give it to someone with a yellow hat and they'll bring it forward. And we'll go through with them and select a few of the better ones. First question, and also I'll write your name because we like to assign credit for questions and I'll ask you to stand up or wave your hand. Rebecca Wayland has a question over there. Right over here. Um, Hi. What, the question is, what does the growth of urbanization mean for our transportation lifestyle of today? Hovering would be great. <laughs> um, <clears throat> that's a really good kind of technical question <laughs> and somebody who's an expert on the, on the Transportation would wade into you know, the new urbanists who uh, you know could give a perfectly wonderful talk like this would say you know do more walkable communities uh, gathered around uh, public transit and one of the things I learned about public transit is BART does it exactly wrong it goes really fast and stops relatively few times <laughs> <laughs> it turns out the best public transit goes relatively slowly and stops lots of times because basically every single stop you see the real estate values go up and um, dense cities clearly are part of what's being sought here but an interesting problem. This thing of uh, people in cities not having children has played out to the point, there was an article in the New York Times about a week ago of wonderful areas of like Portland, Oregon, America's greenest, coolest city in some ways, uh, and the Pearl District, which is the hip new place to live in Portland. Uh, the problem is you don't want to move there with kids because they're closing the schools nearby. There's not enough kids to keep the schools open. They're out in the suburbs, in Oswego and so on. So what hasn't been figured out yet, and here's a design challenge, is how to have plenty of density in a way that is uh, swell for kids. They can find each other, they can grow up, they can feel safe, they can get around. And some of this will be communication, uh, some of this will be transportation issues. So that's the part I know about applying to something I don't know about. Next question. So this is actually a kind of a follow-up question from Sharon. Sharon? You want to raise your hand, right Sharon. Sharon. Brightly uh, lit, Sharon. Um, you didn't really mention suburbs until just now. So where do suburbs fit in? Are people moving from rural places to cities or are they going to suburbs? Do they want city life or do they want suburban life? So are the suburbs cities, or are they not? Are they something different? Well, you've got the, uh, Joel Garreau should be one of the speakers in this thing. Actually, his next book will be just about to come out and would be appropriate for it, uh, which is about basically the various technologies that are transforming, about to transform human nature for the first time. But he did a book called Edge Cities a couple of years ago. that basically pointed out that uh, suburbs uh, grow up to be cities and uh, Tyson's Corner around Washington, D.C. is you know, one of many. We've got a whole bunch of them here in the Bay Area. Uh, basically, you head over the East Bay and over into the valley there, and you're getting into completely uh, 
full, robust, and happening cities, and people there have no need to go to San Francisco and come here for talks like this, and that's about it. Um, likewise, in Marin County, they're talking about uh, putting the railroad back in action for a commuter rail, and uh, you think, oh boy, here comes everybody to their job in San Francisco. Actually, most of the traffic on 101 in, in uh, Marin County is people uh, going around from one part of Marin County to another and they'll probably do the same with the train when it comes in. So what happens is a kind of a fractalization. Uh, in, in suburbs are probably in some ways a temporary phenomenon. It would be wonderful if they were designed more that way, because if they're designed only by gated communities with a uh, you know, strict barrier, the strict limitations on anything cool happening, and uh, very, very limited transportation capabilities, then those parts will get stuck and other parts that are more like these squatter cities where they're kind of making it up as they go will tend to be more dynamic even though they're out in the suburb country. And typically it's these commercial centers which are more like that that become the edge cities. Well, it could have been re residential centers if they were uh, more lively. By the way, one of the things this literature is pointing out is that there's various levels of folks that live in cities and there are now a whole kind of people who live in cities. That is, they spend their time going from one city to another. If they have a fair amount of money, they'll have homes or pied a in each one of those cities. And uh, it's not just one city, it's, it's the whole set of cities that they, uh, they like to live in. So in, more and more, in a sense, every city is becoming a world city. It used to be you only had three or four world cities in the world. Now you have thousands. I have a question. Um, Is that you, because you ran out of good Yeah, No. <laughs> um, you didn't show any dead cities. I mean, cities die too. You show dead villages. Mm -hmm. So um, if the assumption that the young drive cities was to be false and we have mostly older people in the future, does that mean there's going to be a lot of dead cities? The dead cities I'm aware of, this would be a wonderful study. And, and, and when you go to Angkor Wat, you're obviously seeing a, a dead city. Um, typically, capital cities, when a new dynasty comes along, uh, at least in China, and says, OK, that, that's it for this place is the center of the universe. We're going to have the center of the universe over here, or we can build it to my style, Mongol or whatever. And uh, then the old city uh, tends to die pretty quickly. It's a real good question. I'd like to know more about what takes some cities down. It, you know, there's, there's certainly lots of cities who, there's a lot of comparative who's prospering, who's losing the industry, all of this kind of thing, who's making a conversion to from blue collar to white collar. A lot of that kind of analysis is going on. Um, but as far as, Cities just going stone dead. I guess the closest is Newark, New Jersey. Detroit. Uh, Detroit, but you know, even there, I'll bet there's life in the old girl. I'll bet they come back one way or another. Okay. Here's a question from Malcolm Dean. Back away back there. Can you relate liberal versus conservative, red state versus blue state politics to rural versus urban? Well, I was looking for that when I looked at this stuff. Because um, it was sort of a theory I went into it all, that, that so much of the last two elections look like an urban versus rural, center versus coastal. And there's certainly a lot to it. But if the majority <laughs> of America has been urban since, you know, 1940-something, uh, clearly that's not a sufficient explanation because those are the years that elected Franklin Delano Roosevelt and on and on. Um, I think there is, and okay, there's some imbalances that, so that there's more senators per uh, square voter in uh, rural states than there are in urban states. Uh, the Electoral College is a little behind, but it's trying to keep up. Um, I think probably gerrymandering is, uh, is an issue here. It certainly is in Texas. 
And uh, speaking as a Democrat, I am very much in support of uh, Governor Schwarzenegger's urge to uh, put redistricting out there in a fair way in this state so that we don't have the kind of hegemony of Democrats here that uh, we're now having of Republicans in Washington, D.C. That's my humble opinion on that matter. I think that uh, fair redistricting will make the congressional bodies more responsive to the actual layout of where people are and what they think. A question from Eric Nerlich, if I'm saying that correctly, there. Um, do you think that the advantages of cities is their ability to learn, their ability to respond quickly and evolve, and is that the differentiating factor from villages? Yeah, one of the diagrams that I didn't have time to recreate was taking that layered diagram of uh, you know, the pace layers of civilization and say, okay, that applies to cities, but actually cities, and I took Photoshop and I warped it. <laughs> so that the fast parts were big and the nature and culture stuff is a little smaller to give a sense that cities specialize in, in having all those relationships and everything in there. And if they don't have everything in there, they don't function. But they really focus on fashion and commerce and, um, and fast moving infrastructure and this rapid turnover of material. And so that not only do they learn fast because of that approach to things. They may be a little more brittle in some ways. They may go down with an economic downturn, uh, like we were talking about Detroit. But in a sense, the relationship they bear to the whole then is not only do they learn for themselves, they teach everybody else. Cities are always teaching the civilizations they're in how to be civilized or what civilization is about. And so I think it is the case that, that cities do in fact adapt faster, learn faster, and thereby have something to teach everybody who wants to pay attention to what cities are up to. We've had about 13 different variations of this question from Daniel. What is the correlation between food production and urban growth? Who is growing the food? Food production and urban, urban growth. growth. I mean, if, if the uh, villages empty out, will anybody stick around to grow farm? Part of what's going on, look, it's not all uh, that the villages are just boring and, and hardworking. In many cases, there's real environmental degradation in the rural countryside, and it makes it that much harder for a person to get by, even in subsistence mode there, places like Rwanda. But another thing that's going on is a vastly more efficient agriculture, uh, where it's much less labor intensive. You, you, know, you can weigh against agribusiness and, and uh, uh, genetically modified crops and so on, but in fact, these things grow a lot more food uh, with much less need for people doing every damn thing. There's less stoop labor. And so the stoop laborers are coming to town because they're running out of jobs is part of the story. But they're not starving in town. They were starving in the countryside in many cases. And this is part of what brings them to the city. Um, one of the things that happens in the cities in terms of governments is you have a whole lot of voters in one place who can uh, gather and come downtown and say that we're hungry or we need this or we need that. That doesn't happen in the countryside. Uh, so one of the things that cities ensure, and we saw this all the way back in Roman history, is uh, you know, bread and circuses. There will be food, and uh, there will be entertainment. From Eugene, um, does the internet, its connectedness, mitigate the forces driving people to cities? We keep waiting for that, don't we? Everybody's going to telecommute over their super broadband uh, linked to a satellite or something. Um, now, what will it take? I don't know. Uh, I telecommute all the way from Sausalito. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I almost became a firefighter and went to Idaho to study, uh, get a PhD in firefighting, and I would be living in Moscow, Idaho, and I wouldn't have the faintest idea what uh, I would have the internet by now and there'd be a Starbucks in town and I'd be able to get uh, you know, boutique lettuce and stuff like that, but it's 30 years later than everybody else. So 
we're still waiting. Maybe Neil Gershenfeld and the guys who can really manage uh, remote manufacture, uh, desktop little factories, nanotech or something like that, where you can get the stuff. But you know, how it's it, so far the internet is uh, making more of the world feel like they're in a city and less of the city folks feel like they ought to be in the country. <laughs> um, this one is from uh, Jessica Richman. There you are. I'm going to uh, paraphrase it a little bit. Um, if, if does this, uh, is the city state going to become the ultimate un unit of government? If you have a collapsing uh, power of the nation state and you have rising cities, does that mean that um, city state will become the new unit? I think this would be a useful research to do right now. Is, is, is city states a happening thing? Uh, I had the good fortune of being going to Singapore a couple of weeks ago, working with the Singapore government. And years ago, I, I studied Venice like mad because Venice really interests me. For 800 years, they ran a mercantile empire and they danced on the razor's edge of history better than any other entity of their size in Europe. And uh, they managed everybody and that's the way Singapore is behaving these days. This is a country uh, totally without natural resources. And so it treats its people as the main natural resource and has grown them and is a extremely uh, not only a cool place to be, but it's a place where various developing nation city planners and so on, they all traipse to Singapore to see how do you do it. So they're going basically to a city state there. I think that, that uh, as Venice was a success and Rome was a success and Athens and Sparta were both city state successes, if the nations keep being blended back in instead of being the major event uh, that you'll see cities being more and more the players that call the tunes and that, that uh, nations are treated as regions around cities and, and uh, run that way. But you know that's a prediction we can see if it plays out or not. Right now city states are on the rise as such. 